I'm Jonathan P. And right beside me is Michael Wood. And welcome to 1497 Podcast. And we've got you covered with news from the entertainment world, intriguing interviews, everything to do with sports, and of course, we're going to make you laugh along the way. And I want my damn respect too. Yo, yo, ho, yo, what's good? We back. We back. It's Thursday, 12, 17 p. And welcome back to 1497 Podcast, baby. One more day on a Friday. You know what that means. Week two, uh, well, week three of college football, Saturday. Week two of the NFL Sunday. And Week two kind of starts right now. Well, not right now. But y'all get what I mean. Mike, how you feeling? Greatest co-host in the world. Oh, oh. I'm feeling good. You know, you, you said one more day till Friday. Well, nowadays, Wednesday is uh, kind of my my new Thursday, where I look forward to Thursday because we get Thursday night football. I love that Thursday night football is back. The only thing I wish they did on Thursday night football was that they brought Peyton and Eli on to uh, call the game because they were – I don't know if you watch Monday night football – but Peyton and Eli did a, uh, a pretty good job calling that game. Yeah, I caught, I caught like, highlights of, like, their broadcast and, like, them, like, bringing people in, like, Ray Lewis and Russell Wilson, and it was pretty cool. Like, I, I liked everything about it. But speaking about that game, wow. I, a lot of people weren't expecting late fireworks to happen in that game, but it did. Derek Carr to the former – Bills phenomenon, Zay Jones for the game winning touchdown. Like that game was absolutely crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the both teams looked good. And when you really come down to it, don't Ra- Ravens offensive line was a little shaky. But other than that, Lamar and Derek Carr battled it out. Both looked like uh, good quarterbacks and both looked like good teams. The Raiders look better than they've looked in maybe my lifetime or at least since I've been watching football. So it's, we're, it looks like we're going to have a, Few new teams make the playoffs this year, which I'm excited about. Yeah, I'm, but this I is just week one. Just week one. Just week. That's one. true. That's true. Like Lamar, Lamar had some pretty good passing touchdowns, and well, he only had one passing touchdown, but he had some pretty good passes in the game. He had one passing touchdown where he ran out the pocket and then he uh, threw like threw it, uh, thread the needle between. I don't know who the defenders were on the play, but hit Marquise Brown at like the corner towards ish of the end zone but he had two key fumbles that led to points ultimately on the Raiders side and the Raiders defense was playing really good from top from start to finish and they were able to contain Lamar when they needed to the only problem that they had in that first half going into the second half is once they got those key three and outs and turnovers they couldn't really do anything with the ball yeah, I mean, I don't really blame Lamar's um, fumbles on him, especially that last one. I mean, there's some cases where you have to get the ball out, but we're talking about a guy, they're fighting for their lives. Not really, but um, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's such a close game that every possession matters, every play matters, whereas, like, a throwaway isn't going to get you anything. So Lamar's just trying to do his best to extend the play and find someone to get the ball to. So the fumbles, I don't blame on him. Um, I I really don't put too much blame on Lamar for the loss. I mean, there's a few things, obviously, he could have done better, but we can say that about anybody. I think the Ravens' offensive line and their defensive play calling is to blame for the way that the game turned out and the fact that it even got into overtime. Yeah, I I agree. Like, you can't can't really put the blame on Lamar. It was just, like, those fumbles put the Raiders in those key opportunities – the cash in on points. And then another thing that really killed the Raiders in that game was penalties, especially on key drives, driving into that end zone. They had a lot of penalties that knocked them back. I'm pretty sure it was one penalty that they had that knocked them out of field goal range and it made it like third and long. I'm pretty sure Derek Carr got sacked and then they had to punt the ball away. So from going on the next week and the week after, Raiders got to improve on less penalties. They got to be able to convert when they get that great field opportunity or great field advantage in during those games, because that's, it's going to what, when you, those games ultimately. 
Yeah, and so I said this last year. Um, obviously, I, we weren't on the podcast last year, but when I talked to when I talked to buddies last year, I would I would say that the Raiders reminded me of the 49ers the year the 49ers went to the Super Bowl. Um, and I would say that because you know they got a defense a defense that's unproven but young, and they're pretty pretty talented. Mm -hmm. Um, and an an offense that's suitable. Like they got they got a good t a tight end who uh, is the main target in the offense, which George Kittle was. Um, and they, they have a lot of pieces that just remind me of that 49ers team that went to the Super Bowl um, where they, they kind of went into the season underrated. And the next thing you knew or next, yeah, next thing you knew, it was uh, a Super Bowl appearance for the 49ers. So I'm not, I'm see last year, I predicted the Raiders would be in the Super Bowl out of this same theory. And I was way off on that. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to predict the Raiders are going to be in the Super Bowl, but I'm saying this game is not a fluke. I, I think the Raiders are seriously a team to watch out for, and they're going to be a, a huge reason why the Chiefs are going to end up having to play all 17 games, and they're not going to get a chance to rest players because it, it's going to be fighting for the uh, one spot in that division. So, yeah. You, no, go ahead. Go ahead, my brother. No, no, that, that was it. That was it. Uh, the AFC West this year, from top to bottom, is going to be a dogfight. Denver – is really good. They have a really good QB. Yep. And I think if Teddy, God forbid, if Teddy goes down and Drew Locke comes in, they'll be fine either way. Then you got the Chargers offense. And then you got the Raiders too. So like you said, I think they're going to have to play every single game with their starters this year because it's going to be a dogfight, especially in that division. And then the next thing I got to say is for the Raiders, true test is next week. That's their first true test and if they're able to beat the Steelers I think they're playing in Pittsburgh Pittsburgh too so a very hostile area if they're able to beat Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh if they play in Pittsburgh that's going to be one of the best ones that they have all season and I feel like they're going to feed off of that momentum because that's a top defense in the NFL uh okay so you said that's their first true test do you not think that the Ravens are a true test or no because like you got to think about it Ravens were missing a lot of key pieces on. Defense. Okay, okay, okay. I I just wanted to clarify before I yeah. caught you saying that the the Ravens were some sort of uh, cheeks. So no, 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 no. Like Raven, like Ravens offensively, they're missing like they're missing pieces on the offense side and the defensive side. Like they're still a good team, but do I think results might be different? If they had those key pieces, maybe, but it was still a good, great win by the Raiders. All right, all right. I was just clarifying, making sure you weren't um, under. I know you, you're not a huge Lamar guy, but I, I want to make sure you weren't underrating that whole team because that's nah, 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 nah. a good football team over there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know who else is a good football team? Well, you might not think because you hate the other teams besides your team. The Washington football team and the New York Giants, they play tonight. Okay, good football team. I'll, I'll give the I'll give the football team. I'll say they're a good football team. Okay. Um, they got to pick up Cam Newton though. That's that's besides the point. Um, but the New York Giants, man, I was I was so high on Daniel Jones. For I don't really know why. If we're being honest here, um, now that I watch him play and all that, um, he's not he's he's just not that good. Plain and simple, Daniel Jones. Um, I overrated him. I'll be the first one to admit that he he is not very good. I, I don't really know what else to say. He's a turnover machine, and uh, I don't expect um, the Giants to be able to win much with Daniel Jones. That said, I think Saquon Barkley is going to bounce back from his poor week one performance, and uh, it's going to be a game because the football team doesn't really have a quarterback at the moment. I, Heineke's good, but I, I don't know how well he's going to do over the course of the whole season. I think, and I'm going to keep on saying this, I was talking, I've been talking to a lot of my buddies about this too, especially last year during like the draft process, that Taylor Heineke should have been the starter coming out. Should have been the starter coming out. I have faith in Taylor Heineke just because I know it's only one game, but that one game was against a really good team, especially in the rushing attack that Taylor Heineke excels in against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he played absolutely phenomenal in that game. But that's a different conversation for another day. I think Taylor Heineke is going to be a really good quarterback for the Washington football team because the Washington football team does one thing 
very well. And it has a coach that knows how to do that one thing very well. And that's rushing the football. Rushing the football against the Chargers, they had 127 yards and the Chargers only had 90. Now, you would say like Chargers got J.C. Jackson, Austin Eckler. But in reality, when you're looking at it, the Chargers are more of a of a pass offense more than a run more than a run offense. So with Washington, it's the complete flip side. And I think with them excelling in the run with Antonio Gibson involving Taylor Heineke, and then they have to pass when they have to pass is going to really be successful for that offense. And then another thing I'll say before I let you chime in again, I'm not going to criticize Daniel Jones just yet because it's only week one. And you can say so much about that week one matchup against Denver, but down the line, if he plays the same way with Galladay still there, then I'll call him a walking turnover. But for right now, I'm, I'm holding my criticism. Okay. That, that's fair. You're going to hold it um, until he has all his weapons and I'm, I, I should probably hold it, but since he's entered the league, he's uh, first in turnovers um, and pretty much, not pretty much every bad category, but his first in turnover since he's entered the league. Um, so really, by definition, he kind of is a walking turnover. Um, but it is fair. I think his offensive line, he hasn't had a good offensive line since he's been in the league, which makes it tough. I, quarterbacks are going to turn the ball over when they don't have an offensive line. So maybe maybe I'm being too harsh on him, but you know, I got, I got to stick to my guns. I, I got to stick to my gut, and uh, I'm going to say it. That, uh, that they wasted a pick on Daniel Jones. I, I can't remember who the other quarterbacks in that draft were. Was, uh, was that, that 2017 or 2018? I think it was 20. It was either way. Um, I can't remember, but it was a waste, wasted pick. Um, and I think he's going to turn out to be what we will consider a bust. Yeah. And for the Giants to win tonight, Daniel Jones in offense. They got to look better than what they did against Denver because in the first half, they weren't really, really looking that good. I know Saquon's just coming back and everything. But the biggest thing was the protection was non-existent for Daniel Jones. I mean, five tackles for loss, two sacks. He wasn't really able to do anything. He had 267 yards. He was 22 of 37 with one touchdown. And that came towards, like, garbage time, I would say. And then Washington, when they played against the Chargers, they had their two sacks, one interception. And going in their game, going into tonight, they got to be better on third down. They were 30% on third down, which they could obviously be better from 10 attempts on third down situations. They also had penalty troubles, had eight penalties against the Chargers. Some of them hurt more than others. And they got to get the Russian attack rolling early in the game. He had 127 yards for the Washington football team, like I said. And with those rushing attempts, they got six of those off of first downs, or they got first downs off of those six attempts. See, tonight, tonight's game, I don't know how much it says about either team because the, the football team, whether they go with Heineke or not, mm -hmm. this game, is they're still figuring out who their quarterback is going to be. Right. So say he un say he plays great tonight and he ends up starting the rest of the year. I still like this game isn't going to hold too much weight whether or not Heineke is named the starter for the rest of the year. Like he could play great and they could still go and pick up Cam Newton, which a lot of people are speculating, but Ron Rivera said that they're not going to do. Um, but th that's what they did. He played great in the playoffs and they ended up getting Fitzpatrick instead of sticking with Heineke. Mm -hmm. So this game doesn't really say to because we don't know how good either team is yet. Um, Washington played, like you said, a, a pretty good uh, team. And uh, the Chargers, I was about to say the um, – what, what are they? What, uh, what city the Los, is Lo – Los Angeles, LA. What did um, they used to be? What, what did they used to be? San okay. Diego. All right. Yeah. I was about to say San Diego. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they played a good team last week. And the, the Giants – based off of last year, did not play a good team. But the Broncos look good, like you mentioned earlier. So, but the Broncos look good, and they dominated the Giants, whereas the Chargers looked good, and it was a close game against Heineke, um, as opposed to Fitzpatrick, who was a starter. So, I'll, this this could be an important game, but just looking at it purely from, I don't think the Giants are going to be that good of a team, and 
I think the football team has a chance to win the NFC East. I don't see it as too big of a, a game as far as playoff implications go. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not too interested in the game tonight, if I'm being, if I'm being honest. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, think, I think it's going to be a good defensive battle, low-key, because, like, they're both good defensive teams. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see it. So I wish we had, like, the Staples button where, like, I forgot, like, what it says. But, like, when you press it, it, like, says, like, what – you know you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's – yeah, the red one, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, like – I think it says, like, help me or something. Like, some, something like that. Something along those lines. And you I, can't, I actually can't remember what it says. Hey, but it says it says what it says, like, once you press it, right? So I wish we yeah. had one of those buttons. So – it would say panic when we press it after this week because there's a lot of teams that we could throw in this boat where if they go 0-2, we might have to hit the panic button. So my question to you is, what team, if they were to lose on Sunday, would you start panicking about? Uh, well, it depends. Um, because are we talking like – if they lose like a close, like if they lose like the Ravens lost um, against, because if, if the Ravens lose like that again, like a close game goes to OT against the Chiefs, I don't think that's a team we, we worry about. Like, are you talking about like, just they go 0-2 like in general, right? Mm -hmm. uh, see, this is this is tough. I want to say the Bills. You're, I want to say your Buffalo Bills. Oh. The reason being, they played the Dolphins who did not play a great game. That, In all honesty, the we thought the AFC East would be um, the Dolphins, the Patriots, and the and the Bills like fighting it out. Um, but I, I really don't think the AFC East looks all that great from all the games I watch. I mean, the Bills are going to be are going to end up finding their rhythm and being good. Um, but the, that whole division did not look good. The Dolphins and the Patriots both um, played subpar games, and it was close because they played each other. But a team that I think we got to panic about if they lose. This is this is uh curious. I I'm gonna have to say the Green Bay Packers because they're playing the Detroit Lions. I mean, they're playing the Detroit Lions with Jared Goff uh, as as the quarterback. And don't get me wrong, they only lost by eight. But anyone who watched the game knows that it was a blowout, and the Lions never really had a true shot at winning. Um, so yeah, I gotta go with the Green Bay Packers because Rodgers played his worst game of his career. Well, arguably, I think it was probably one of the worst of his career. They lost 38 to three against the saints who, like I said, Jameis Winston running the table over there. So, yeah, I think the Packers are a team we got to worry about, especially if it's um, a, a big loss. Like if they, like I said, if they lose like how the Raven Ravens lost like an OT game, then I'm not going to be super worried, but if they get blown out. Then that's, it's really something to worry about. Yeah. Against Detroit too. The reason I'm not worried about the Packers because Aaron Rodgers said that vocabulary word that, really sunk in with me for a long, long time. R-E-L-A-X. Relax. And it's just it's just one game. And we've seen Aaron Rodgers bounce back before when he had games like that. And we've seen him do some things that not a lot of quarterbacks can do. So I'm not really worried if they were go if they were to go 0 2. The team that I would be worried about is Tennessee. And they went 0-2 because they had a lot of – they acquired Julio Jones. Derrick Henry is always, you know, he's always training. Like, everyone's training, but he was training really hard in the offseason. And Derrick Henry is, like, one of those great regular season backs where he has 1K, uh, 1K rushing yard season after another. But – it didn't look like that against Arizona. And if they play the Seahawks and the Seahawks look the way that they did against Indianapolis week one, I, I, I would start hitting the panic button for Tennessee because that division, the Colts could easily win that division, if I'm being honest. So, and then the Titans, they also got to figure out their protection because they let out five sacks. And Chandler Jones, I'm pretty sure, got all of those five sacks, nine QB hits, eight tackle for losses, and then their defense looked absolutely miserable, just getting dotted on every single every single play. It's like you're a little kid and you want ice cream, 
and like you ask for ice cream and then your parents are like no and they start eating ice cream in front of you and then they eat more ice cream in front of you that's that's how ryan Tannehill and his boys on the offense side looked at that defense yeah i mean i i, I agree the tit- titans did not look good um it's in, it's gonna be interesting to see how they try and work out um all the problems that they did have derrick henry um did not rush like I would expect him to rush um, against the Cardinals. Well, the Cardinals improved in a lot of ways that many people kind of overlooked. They were like, oh, they got J.J. Watt, whatever, right? They got A.J. Green, whatever. These are just two old guys. But they got a lot of other pieces in there mixed in that weren't such big-name free agents that they that they acquired um, and, and made differences. And Chandler Jones um, has been one of the best pass rushers in the league for years. He's kind of gone unrecognized. And uh, it, I, I don't think anyone's going to um, disrespect him anymore after that that game but yeah see the reason I don't want to panic about the Titans is different than the reason you don't want to panic about the Packers you don't want to panic about the Packers because they got Aaron Rodgers which is a great great thing Aaron Rodgers in my opinion is the greatest quarter the best quarterback to ever play not the greatest but if the Titans lose the whole the situation in their division is going to look like this right although so the Houston Texans um, are one and oh everyone else has is 0-1. The Jaguars are going to lose against the Broncos. That's my prediction. Um, the Colts, that's tough. I don't know if they're going to beat the Rams. Um, and then the, the Titans, if they lose, they're 0-2, right? So the team's ahead of them, because I think the Colts have to play the Rams, which is tough. Mm-hmm. So s- say the Colts end up winning, right? They're 1-1. One and one. Um, and then say Houston and Jacksonville somehow both win. Then we got 2-0, 1-1, 1-1, 0-2. Houston will not end up being first in the division. They will not stay a winning team. Um, it's just not going to happen. Jacksonville will also not – they won't be at 800 or at 500. They're going to probably be like max six wins. Whereas the Colts are a team you got to worry about if the Colts win and the Titans lose. But I, I think I think the Titans are going to play, play a big game. Um, the Seahawks' defense looked better than it did all of la- any game last year, which I don't think is going to happen again. I, I really don't. Uh, the Colts off- offensive line, I don't know what happened with it. Um, but it, it's going to be something to watch out for because the Cardinals demolished the Titans and the Seahawks kind of demolished the Colts as far as pass rushing standpoint. So it it's a tough one because I, I don't think any of the teams that really lost that are 0-1 are, are at a huge like disadvantage. I mean – the Bills, we expect them to be good. The Colts, we expect them to be good. Titans, we expect them to be good. Browns, uh, Ravens, we expect them to be good. Like those are those are teams that all lost their first game. That I don't I don't know if there's a huge panic about it. Whereas like the Packers are a team we have so much uncertainty surrounding because mm-hmm. everything that happened with Aaron Rodgers training camp wasn't really there. So there's so much uncertainty around the Packers that it, it kind of makes me wonder like. What, what if Aaron Rodgers has actually, like, fallen off a cliff? I, I don't think so at all by any means. But if they lose, uh, they get blown out by the Detroit Lions, then that's certainly something we got to think about. What what if – obviously, I'm, I'm, I won't say it. I won't admit Aaron Rodgers fell off a cliff, but it's possible um, if they get blown out. So I, there's a lot of teams that I have, like, slight worries about, but the biggest team I have worries about is the Green Bay Packers. I can, I can, I can respect that. I can respect that. That's – because, like – Aaron Rodgers had like a Maverick type season where, or yeah, Maverick type off season where it was just him. Like he was independent throughout the whole off season. Like he didn't say a peep to the uh, organization like before he did. But other than that, he was like he was just minding his p's and q's basically. But I can I can see that. I can I can attest to that. Man. Oh wait wait one more thing if we're moving on from this. This isn't the around the same light, but this is just a fun fact. Aaron Rodgers um, and the Green Bay Packers lost thirty-eight to three to the New Orleans Saints. You know who else lost thirty-eight to three to the New Orleans Saints last year? Who? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But 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 it gets even inch, more interesting. Ooh. Aaron Rodgers' last uh, time where he opened the season throwing two interceptions was two thousand ten, the same year he won the Super Bowl. So maybe Rodgers is just trying to put all these superstitions uh, uh, on his side where if the last team that lost to the Saints 38 to three won the Super Bowl last time I threw two picks in the opener won the Super Bowl. So maybe he's just, he's doing this on purpose trying to win the Super Bowl. 
maybe, maybe, maybe he's foreshadowing something that we need to start looking at. I think we need to start talking about more theories on this show, starting with that one, because that's a good theory. That's a very good theory. Right there. Also, I'm not like, I only say the Green Bay Packers because it's one of the teams that I, uh, besides the Eagles, that I, I, I gravitate towards more because, you know, my mom's a Packers fan. So I do like the, I do like the Packers. So that's why if they lose in their own two, it kind of worries me. Um, but they're going to get Bakhtiari back. Their pass protection is going to be better. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time just rambling about the Green Bay Packers. But, yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried if they go down on two. Anyway, ne- next topic. Whoops. Ooh. College football! College game day! At Penn State! At night. I, I was going to ask you where, where college game day was because I didn't know. Penn State, baby, Penn State. So, you know, Penn State at night, it's going to be wide out. So let's talk about the games that are big for college football this weekend. I'll start it off. Alabama versus Florida. Bama, Florida. That's their first challenge of the year for both teams. And obviously, we look for teams to try to challenge Alabama because if ultimately they just play teams, blow them out, play next team, blow them out, so on and so forth. So for Florida, this is a really big game. The last time Florida has won against Bama was in 2008 in the SEC championship game. So I think Florida's definitely looking for some revenge after what's been happening since 2008. And, yeah, that's bad. I I, I dropped dropped a pen here. Um, No, you start it. You start it. A game I'm interested in uh, is Miami and Michigan State. Um, Ooh, that's on my list. Because Michigan State's looked really, really, really good, and Miami has not. They got blown out by Alabama, and then they had a close one with App State. Um, another one that's um, going to interest me is Cincinnati and Indiana, because I think Indiana is a seriously um, – although they lost week one, they're still a team to look out for um, because they, they had a pretty good year last year, and they got a lot of returning players. So that's another game that could be a top 25 team losing. Um, and then a game that's kind of just like, if you want to tune in, uh, you know, w- watch a, a good game, but it's not like a ranked team, ranked teams going at, it's, it's Minnesota, Colorado. Ooh, that's a good. Those are some good slate of games. My other games that I had, you said one of them, Michigan State versus Miami and Penn State versus Auburn. I really think if Penn State wins this game, they have a solid resume so far that can push them into the category of, being top eight top seven almost because they look so good against Wisconsin and then they blew out their other opponent that they played last week so I'm really excited to see can this Penn Penn State defense stay up with the hype that I have them at right now because of that Wisconsin game that Wisconsin game really sticks out to me because it was bend don't break for Penn State right they get Wisconsin comes down in that comes down in the red zone. They get stopped. Come down in the red zone again. They get stopped. Come down in the red zone again. They get stopped. And for the whole first half, they were shutting down Wisconsin's offense. Wisconsin couldn't do a damn thing towards that Penn State's defense. And then it was, it was kind of the same way. And then some light started. Excuse me. Some lights started dropping. Some plays started happening. But ultimately, when Penn State had to make those plays, Penn State made those plays. Michigan Michigan and Miami, I'm excited for that because, like Mike said, Michigan State, they've been looking really good. And this is their first true test of the season against a ranked opponent in Miami. I think they're going to be pretty mad coming into this game. You know, you get blown out by Bama, which was expected. And you haven't been really looking good. You got into a close game last week. So we really get to see a true dogfight in both teams. And Michigan State's running back, Kenneth Walker, has been looking absolutely astounded at the running back position. So I'm, I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to see both of those quarterbacks and Jake Garcia and Peyton Thorne battle it out. That's going to be a fun game to watch. Indiana and Cincinnati, that's going to be a fun game to watch too, Mike. 
because uh, Indiana's got something to prove to us if there's if they can still compete with Cincinnati or compete with the top twenty five team, and if they can sneak back into the top twenty five. Yeah, they started the year top twenty five. That's why I'm interested in the game. Like I said, and Cincinnati, don't get me wrong, great team, but their they their opponents aren't always that great, right? So playing a team like Indiana, who was preseason ranked in the top 25, I think they were, I can't, you know, I don't want to say anything. I don't remember, but mm-hmm. they were, they were like 17th, 17th or something. Um, so they're playing a, a team that was preseason ranked. This is going to be their, I'm considering it them playing a ranked team because other than uh, Indiana, let's see who else do they have? Oh, never mind. After this game, they got Notre Dame. Um Immediately after, and then never mind. No one, no one else of uh, any importance after this. But so they got Indiana right now, and then Notre Dame next week. So if they win against Indiana, and then they lose against Notre Dame, um, who by the way is at number twelve, which is surprising to me. I know that they had a close game, but everyone, all in the committee, loves Notre Dame. So this this is a game that's going to show us what Cincinnati is about, and them winning this game could go a long way. Uh, in the college football playoff, if there's like only two unbeatens and there's a bunch of teams with one, teams with one loss, so say they end up having one loss somewhere along the line, they can be like, "Hey, we beat this team," and Indiana might be ranked at the end of the year. They'd be like, "Hey, we beat this team that you guys all thought was really good," and uh, so yeah, I think it's going to be an important game. Uh, there's there's obviously no looking around it. I didn't say this one, but you said it, and that's Alabama, Florida. I, I could just gloss over it, but I mean, it, it, like you said, first big test for both teams. You could say Miami was a test for Alabama, but if that's what Miami, if that's what Alabama's tests are going to look like, there's no reason to have a season because this this season is over. Bryce Young, Heisman, Alabama, uh, Natty Champs, because Miami gave them no test. So hopefully Florida can do a little bit better. And Anthony Richardson, I think that's his name, gets yeah. to start. Hopefully he does. Hopefully he does. You know. There's a song back in the day called All About the Benjamins. You know, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. It's all about making that money. But it's also about being at a level where you can walk away and be like, man, I'm here. So we haven't done this in a while. So let's talk about who belongs in the Hall of Fame, Horace Grant. Ken Riley edition. Let's get it started. Let's get it started. Uh, uh, you want to you want to start with the uh, the Cincinnati legend, Ken Riley? Yeah, I think we're going to both have an agreement on this. I'm gonna keep this short and simple. Ken Riley is a Hall of Famer. He is top five in interceptions all time. He is above a Packers legend, Charles Woodson. Uh, he has Bengal records that I'm pretty sure that hasn't even been broken yet. Uh, his interceptions by return yards and his interceptions via touchdowns uh, are records in the Bengals book. I thought this was pretty cool to add. Uh, Ken Riley's best career or yeah, best performance in his career was 1976. Picking off Broadway Joe twice in his last season. Didn't miss one game in his 11 of 15 seasons. So he was an Iron Man for the first 11 seasons. And like I said, top five in career interceptions, had a great career. Ken Riley is a Hall of Fame. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so Ken Riley, um, I see, I, I'm going to say yes, obviously. I mean, but I'm just look, looking this up right now. So Ken Riley, um, which is ridiculous, he's. I mean, he, he died, I think, um, last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did a, one of the 1497 facts was about Ken Riley. I think it was actually the, the first or the second first or the second one. Um, he's fifth all time in interceptions. Um, and he never made the Pro Bowl. Not only did he never make the Pro Bowl, um, but he also didn't make the Hall of Fame. So I think that's got to have something to do with it is the fact he never made the Pro Bowl, which I don't understand. I know the Pro Bowl is a popularity contest, but this man is fifth all time in interceptions and you don't have him in the Hall of Fame nor a single Pro Bowl appearance. It's ridiculous. Ken Riley is a Hall of Famer and uh, there's really no getting around it. Um, I'm not going to stall any longer. Horace Grant, 
Now you think about big threes and you think about all the players that really portray a big role in a big three, right? You got the like Showtime Lakers, you got the Celtics, then you got obviously the Bulls. And I think you might you might say otherwise. I think you might say otherwise, but I think Horace Grant is a Hall of Famer because when he left the Bulls to join Orlando and that big three with Shaq, Penny, and obviously himself, the Bulls declined by eight games. So they lost eight more games without him. And then with them, they won 10 more games. So you do that plus minus. With them, they're plus two more. They win two more games. And then without them, they they lose two more games. And when Michael Jordan, you know, left, did his thing, and Scotty had his MVP candidate type season, James, or not James Harden, uh, Horace Grant was first in blocks, rebounds, first in blocks, rebounds, shooting, and second in scoring and stealing. And then he had some key moments where he blocked Kevin Johnson's game winner and game winning pass, John Paxson. So I'm not going to sit up here and throw all these statistics at you, but 68% of the 37 players that have won four or more championships, a part of a big three, are in the Hall of Fame. Kevin Kevin McHale being one of them. Yeah, this is, see, this is a tough one. Um, oh, he's got four titles. I mean, he's he's tied tied with the the, uh, the all time greatest player of all the greatest player of all time. Whoops. Um, the the thing is, he played with the Bulls, which I would say was probably his, his best years. Um, a couple, the two first two in Orlando, he was he was pretty good too. But I would say his, his Bulls years were definitely the best. He was on the all defensive second team four times. He was an all star one time, and he he averaged eleven and eight over his career. So it's nothing like that that stands out at you. But like you said, he was a huge piece in um in the Bulls dynasty there. Um, before they got Dennis Rodman, he was a huge factor. And when he left, you gotta. You have to bring this up as much as I don't want to bring it up. Not only did the Bulls lose Horace Grant, they also lost Michael Jordan, uh, who in many people's eyes is the greatest player ever. And they they only dropped off eight games, which kind of says a lot about how good that Bulls team was. They lost two of their three best players, and they only lost eight less games. They only won eight less games. So that's that says a lot about how good that Bulls team was. But they didn't win a championship, right? Horace Grant was a big part in getting that championship. Obviously, so was Michael Jordan. Um, but you can make the argument that when Michael Jordan left, if Horace Grant had stayed, the Chicago Bulls would have still won the finals. And I would I would uh, stand by that argument because that's how important I think Horace Grant was to the Chicago Bulls. Because in the playoffs, he stepped up even more, um, played even better. He was like 15 and uh, I think 10 in the playoffs, which is pretty good um, when you're playing with a guy who's averaging like 34, 35. Um, and then Scotty, who's averaging 20, 22. So that's three guys with a – Averaging like almost 80, um, below like 75. So, I mean, yeah, he, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, his stats and accolades might not show it, which means he might not get in. But in my eyes, he's uh, one of the best players to uh, ever play the game, which is why he, he belongs in the Hall of Fame. And th- this is the case with many of the guys we do on here. The Hall of Fame is about uh, individual accolades, um, just as much as it is about stats and championships. So, unfortunately, I don't know if he will ever get in. Um, I sure hope he does, though. No, I, I hope he does, too. And then, like, with guys like that, you got to look at, like, because, like, the stats are is not going to really help you. So, then you got to look at, all right, what was his biggest role and how did he fulfill that role, especially in the playoffs. Like, the playoffs really makes a Hall of Fame resume because if you're constantly playing good in the playoffs, you should be in the Hall of Fame. Like, Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco is – undeniably he's going to be in the Hall of Fame based off his playoff performances. I mean, most road wins in the playoffs of all time in the NFL. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I said no to Joe Flacco. And that's the thing, because his, his arrow is so good. But Horace Grant, the 1990s, as much as people want to believe it, and I know you're a big, you're a big uh, 
voice um, advocating for this. The 1990s was not that good. There were not that many great players in the 1990s. Oh, um, oh. wait, you said – wait, wait, are you saying, like, I'm advocating that I think the 90s were good, like, player-wise? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I got confused for a second. And a great – this is – I was having a, a, an argument with someone the other day. This is so off topic, but I think I should bring it up here. Mm-hmm. The 1990s were not that good. Let me tell you why. Michael Jordan, best shooting guard. Who was the second best shooting guard? Clyde Drexel. Yeah, Clyde Drexel. Scotty Pippen was the best small forward. Who's the second best small forward? Um, um, honest, because like there's a lot of there's a lot of good like guys. Name one. Can, name one. Name one that, who just comes to mind. from from any from any position from from no, any no, no, position? small forward small forward in the 1990s other than Scotty Pippen. Yeah, man. It's tough. Like, it's it it's is tough. It is tough because like Scotty played really. Scotty played out of his mind. But I mean, like at the same time, you could have like like besides like Kevin Durant, who fits in that second spot as small forward. Kawhi Leonard. No, do you see what I'm saying though? Yeah, I, I see what you said. I see what you said. That's that's. That's valid. That's much- valid. I'm not gonna lie. That's valid. People. People want to say that the 1990s was all that, but in reality, it really there was there was a bunch of like Michael Jordan, Reggie Miller, who by the way I think was better than Clyde Drexler, Reggie Miller. Um, Michael Jordan, Reggie Miller, Clyde Drexler, um, Scotty. You got David Robinson, I guess. Patrick Ewing, Charles Barkley, like oh, all these guys. Count, you can't count Barkley, no, because they play power forward. They play main. No, no, I'm just, power forward. I'm just saying, like these are these are all guys that like when people think of the 90s, you think of. Like Dennis, Reggie, oh. Stockton, Malone, Hakeem. You can think of all those guys, but mm-hmm. really that's only like 10, 11, 12 players. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of guys that people know. And maybe that's just because we're younger and we weren't alive. Because um, maybe like if we're both lucky enough to have children, if you want to have children, they, they won't know who like Tony Snell is. Or that's just off, like, off the top of my head. They won't know like Jaron Jackson Jr. Like there's, there's some guys that maybe our kid won't know. Um, but, yeah, my, my argument for the 90s is really – it was super top-heavy, and so were the teams. Uh, there weren't, like, a whole, like, a lot of players that really stand out to me other than, like, the big-name ones. But, yeah, I don't know how I got so off track there. <laughs> Whoops. I got to – we, we got to talk about that on the show because, like, you know, man, I, I, love, I love me some 90s basketball. I think the 90s, as in defensive perspective – you can't you can't say now is better than the 90s 90s defense was so physical to the point where nothing was like if anything was a foul now like you breathe on someone it's a foul you literally point at someone it's a foul like the game is so soft it makes me sick it makes me sick to my stomach how soft the game is now and i think with like guys that like like kevin durant and like all of them, they would still get their 20. They would still get their, they would still get their daily numbers, but it'd be harder for them to do it in that era because they're constantly being deed up, actually deed up game in and game out every single game with that physicality. Offensively, offensively, it was like, it wasn't like really like shooting from the outside. It was more like mid range drive yourself to the bucket that's where you got your mjs of the world your gary paytons of the world you got your sean kemp's of the world uh james worthy when he was still in james worthy magic johnson all those guys okay okay i this is this is a little disrespectful um because this guy was he's a legend but Mm -hmm. muggsy bows is five three running around getting buckets on dudes I mean, you t- there will never be a 5'3 guy in the NBA. Spud Webb, too, was a short short guy, 5'4", I believe. There will never be a guy. What is he? He's 5'7", right? The, the, he's still short. I, IT, the, the I'm say, Boston I'm Celtics saying. IT? I'm, that was like two years, though. Muggsy Bowes was running around. He was averaging like eight assists a game. He was like a, a good – consider a good point guard. You will not see another five foot. 
three man in the NBA who plays at the level Muggsy Bowes did, just because that era was not like that was not not that great of an era. Muggsy Bowes was getting buckets. Isaiah Thomas, you're right. He he got buckets for a time, but now now where is he? He's uh, Muggsy Bowes played for a, a, a fairly long time, and uh, yeah, I mean he was Muggsy Bowes. Think about it. Isaiah Thomas was the what? He was the last pick in the draft. He was the 60th pick. <laughs> Muggsy Bowes was the 12th pick. You're telling me that only 11 guys are better than someone who's five foot three? I, I find that hard to believe. Isaiah Thomas back in the day, five foot seven. If he was him and Muggsy Bowes were switched, Muggsy Bowes would not play a single NBA game uh, nowadays. And Isaiah Thomas would be one of the better scorers in the 1990s. You can't you can't tell me different. That's a hot take. That if I te so hold on, hold on, run that back, Turbo. I, I know we are we're we are so off topic right now, but this conversation is just too intriguing for me not to take a bite at it. So you're saying IT, if he was Muggsy Bo's side, re- repeat what re- no, no. repeat the if thing you, that you just said. Just repeat you, the repeat the clan. If you swapped Muggsy Bo's and Isaiah Thomas, you just swapped them. Isaiah okay. Thomas would be one of the better scorers in the NBA in the 1990s, and Muggsy Bowes would not play a single minute in the NBA. Now it is. Come on now. Come, come. I mean, even, even, with IT, even with IT at his size, at 5'7", he was still getting buckets in, in the 80s. And the 80s was probably more physical than the 90s. You saw dudes punching dudes in the in the 80s, and the referees were encouraging that. But that, that, Isaiah, that Isaiah Thomas was six foot. We're talking about Muggsy Bowes, who's nine inches shorter. No, than no, that. I'm talking about I'm talking about the real IT. Oh, you talking about the IT from Boston? I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm t- you talking about the Detroit IT, right? The, the no, I'm IT saying I'm if, about- if, if you replace IT from Boston with Muggsy Bowes, oh. I, IT from uh, from Detroit was like six foot. Yeah, I was about to say. That's what I thought but, you were saying at first. Oh no, okay, Isaiah Thomas from our era is five nine. Right, five five nine, which is six inches taller than Muggsy Bowes, and he's fifty five pounds heavier. You're telling me a man who's hundred thirty pounds is going to be getting buckets in the NBA? Hell no, Muggsy Bowes would not do any. You're telling me Muggsy Bowes goes up trying to get a layup on like LeBron. LeBron is just going to uh, body him and swat it down. LeBron is Carl Malone with Giannis's athleticism. Carl Malone build Giannis athleticism. No one built like that. So I don't know how, how I got out of that. No, nah, no, nah, you could. I mean, I mean, if you also got to think that if he's able to get to the free throw line and get fouled, because this era is soft. You cannot, it's softer. No, I agree. A, I agree. I don't like cupcake. I don't like how it's played. But then you also got to talk about the 2000s too. The 2000s, like from early 2000s to the mid 2000s. That's a good era too. That's that's gonna we're talking about that next week. What which era was the best? I'm probably gonna say the nineties. And if I don't right. say the nineties, I'm gonna say the two thousands. But but shoot. If we're if we're talking skill, if we're talking skill wise, right now is better than any era, and that's not debatable. No, yeah. Like, there's so many, yeah. there's so many great, there's so many great shooters, there's so many great yeah. ball handlers. Like offensively, right now is the best era. But yeah, I, actually. Right. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that Monday, cause or two or Thursday, whatever that. All right, let's do ninety-seven seconds of trying to answer fourteen questions, and then we'll get to our pop culture stuff, and then wrap up the show. Cause I know you got something to do. Yeah. So actually, I don't even have fourteen questions for you. I got oh. one question, which requires fourteen answers. Uh, what? Oh, the, whoa. Throwing me a curveball. And th- this one, I you should be you should be able to get it done, but you cannot use your phone. All right, that that that's what makes it a little a little tough here, the not being able to use your phone part. Done. So I can answer this in fourteen different ways. No, 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 no. You can answer it in. It's your opinion, but there's fourteen answers. Okay. Okay. So you want me to give you all fourteen answers, or you want you'll, me to- you'll you'll fi- you'll you'll figure it out once I say it. Not right, cool. Just give me one second here. 
If you guys are still listening to this magnificent podcast, you know, what's the what's the best era of basketball? Because, like, that's a really good question. Someone yesterday, off topic again, we were talking about best guards to ever play. And a couple of people said Gilbert Arenas. Interesting. One of the best from the 2000s for sure. All right, are you ready, Mr. Keenan? I am ready for liftoff, sir. Let's see the phone. See the phone. Hold it up the whole time. Shit. <laughs> All right. Rank the NFL teams currently 1 to 14. 1 to 14. All right. Uh, whip, up, 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 uh. Buccaneers at 1. Rams at 2. Steelers at three, just because how their defense looked. Bills at four. Five, we got, let's see. Um, five, I would say the Washington football team, just because their defense, their defense. Um, six, I got... Seattle, seven, um, seven. Oh, wait, hold up, hold up. Let me run that back. Hold up, hold up. I can't believe I forgot this team. All right, one, you got the Buccaneers. Two, you got the Chiefs. Three, you got the Steelers. Four, you got the Bills. Five, you got the, you got the Seahawks. Six, you got the Washington football team. Seven, you got you got the Chargers. Eight. Whoa. Wait, I forgot this team again. Hold on. Chiefs at one. All right, Buccaneers at one. Chiefs at two. Rams at three. Did I say the Rams before? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Oh, I did? Yeah. All right, I'm going to. So I said Bucks, one. Chiefs, two. Three Steelers, or no, not Steelers, Rams. Four Steelers. Five Seahawks. Six Colts. Seven. We're going to switch the Colts. We're going to put the Chargers at six. I really liked how their offense played in week one. Chargers six. Seven, I'd throw the Colts. Eight, nine, and ten. Ten, I'd throw the Cowboys just because how their, their offense looked really good. And I think we're, we weren't really expecting that, to be honest with you. And we weren't expecting their defense to look kind of the way it did, even though they gave up that that play, which was pass interference, offensive pass interference. So that's a different conversation for another day. All right, John. We have just hit the three minute mark and you got to like six. Well see, see it's kind of no. it's kind because you, the whole, you really gotta you gotta really think about it. I know the whole the whole point was was so that you would not get it. Um because I was in a rush for time and I couldn't come up with four I had like six questions and I was like shoot we're about to start. So I was like, you know what? This is a good one. This was actually, um, this was going to be one of my, one of my questions was just going to be rank the teams one to 14. And then I was going to have 13 more questions. Imagine how hard that would have been. That, that would have been, that would have been pretty hard. This was like, are you able to come up with 14 teams? What, no. what time? That, that, that was pretty hard. Low, no. High key. All right. And then we got to make some NFL picks for this week because, you know, we got Thursday night football tonight. So. Are you ready? Washington football team. Well, you got Washington football team tonight? Yeah. All right. All right. Then we got uh, like seven more games for you to for you to call here. Nice. We got the Rams, Rams and the Colts. Matthew Stafford and the Rams, baby. Matthew Stafford and the Rams. I picked the Colts for anyone wondering. And then we got the the I think it's the game of the week, the Ravens and the Chiefs. 
you can't pick against Patrick Mahomes. I hate to say that, but it, it makes me sick to my stomach saying that. But the Chiefs. But the Chiefs, I picked the Ravens. <laughs> and then we got New York Giants and the Washington football team, and we know who you're picking. WT or WFT. Yes, sir. That, that would be the first one that you and I both agree on. I have the Washington football team as well. And then we got uh, our hometown team, not really the team we enjoy, but the Bengals and the Bears. Bengals. Ooh, another one we disagree on. I got Chicago bouncing back from a tough one. All right, and then we got my game, the game I'm looking forward to the most, the Eagles and the 49ers. Just for you and for a couple other reasons, I'm going with the Eagles. Another one we agree on. Wow. All right, then we got a game that could be interesting. Uh, We got the Broncos and the Jaguars. Broncos. Another one we agree on. Mr. King, we're looking on a we're on a we're on a nice little roll here. And then we got the Titans and the Seahawks. Titans looking to bounce back from a tough week. Seattle. All right. That's our uh another disagree there. For anyone wondering, John and I did terrible last week. That was absolutely atrocious. Like there, there's no other no way around it. Um it was it was something not to be proud of. Yeah, so it was like, I was like, man, I was like Kanye, like thinking about like, man, I really am in an entanglement right now. Like, geez. And then we got the final game, which is two rookie quarterbacks going up against each other. We got the New York Jets versus the New England Patriots. Pats. It was a tough one. I hate to say it, but it's the Pats. I also have the Pats. All right. So I'm going to give you a chance to change any answers you want to. I'm locking them all in. You're locking them all in? I'm locking them all in. All right. I'm also locking them all in. So we are looking to, re- or to uh, rewrite history as we both went. To- combined, we went one in seven, um, which is obviously, if you don't understand math, not very good. Terrible. It's terrible, right. you guys. Terrible. That's that's the end of our NFL pick section of the day. Yeah. Uh, basically, pop culture. Uh, I'm just finding more evidence as to Drake having a, an affair with Kim Kardashian. Uh, Riverdale's good. That's all I got to say. Riverdale's good? <laughs> yeah, Riverdale's pretty good. It's a good show. If you need a show to watch on Netflix, watch Riverdale. I might look into it. I'm looking for something new to watch on Netflix. I watched – God, we sound like such losers. I watched <laughs> I watched the uh, Vampire Diaries, and I was a big fan of that. Really? I was I, – I really couldn't get into it. Like, I started watching it before, didn't get into it, then started watching it again, couldn't get into it. So I might, I might watch that once I'm done with Riverdale. Because Once I watch yeah. the show, I just binge watch it. Yeah, now, now we both sound like complete losers, but it's okay. Yeah, we but sound yeah, like – I mean, I, I don't have any news. Sorry to cut you off there. No, nah, you good. We sound like like two teenagers crying over, like, boy troubles and eating popcorn and talking about our high school gossip. That that was completely off topic, but – I was, I was going to say, I didn't have to get that serious. Yeah. Well, the that- – we're going to end the show off of that. So thank you for tuning into 1497. Paul Kiss, Paul Kiss. As always, subscribe to 1497 Podcast on all podcasting platforms, plus YouTube. Like and comment our videos on YouTube. Check out Cooper Nord interview out now on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and that little bird that tells me to wake up each and every morning and be great called Twitter. As always, trust the process. We will catch you later on Monday. What's the best era to play basketball? Let us know. Great question. Peace.